2002 Chevy Silverado with a 4.8 liter engine and we are addressing an EVAP vent control circuit problem and that's our PO449 trouble code. First thing that you want to understand when you have a code like this where it says vent control circuit is this is not an EVAP leak problem. There's some type of electrical circuit fault on this vent solenoid and uh, that definitely helps for direction as far as what you're doing. There's no need at this point to do a smoke test or do a leak test. When you see a code that says vent control circuit, any, any trouble code that's gonna say circuit is gonna be an electrical fault. So we're gonna focus on the solenoid, the wiring, the computer for this trouble code. All right, next thing I wanna show is whether or not this is a hard fault, meaning this is happening right now, or if it's an intermittent fault. And the way I'm going to do it on this vehicle, this is unique to GM, is I can click on this failed this ignition and you see there are no codes present right now under failed this ignition. So that's this ignition cycle. Um, go ahead and start the truck. And you see that our EVAP vent control circuit low trouble code, our PO449, came back immediately under failed this ignition, so this is a hard fault. Okay, go ahead and shut it off. Turn the key back on. Um, there's other ways to do that too. What you could do is clear the codes and then start the truck and, and reread the trouble codes and see if it immediately comes back. But this is a hard fault, which is very helpful for us in doing a diagnosis on a circuit problem, um, that it is a hard fault, meaning happening right now is critical in making the correct call on this problem, whether it be solenoid, wiring, computer. Again, it's happening right now, so it shouldn't be a problem. All right, the first thing I want to do, okay, the first thing I want to do is circuit design. And when you're dealing with a vent solenoid, any solenoid, it's important that you understand whether or not it's power or ground side switched, power or ground side control. So that's gonna affect our diagnosis. And one of the first things that I would do is look at a wiring diagram. And I've done that already. I pieced in um, a diagram on this page. I just cut out some pieces and tied it together just for time reasons. Uh, this is a five page diagram on Mitchell and I just pulled the pieces apart. And uh, our vent solenoid is right here. I have it highlighted already too. EVAP canister vent, tells you where it's located too. Uh, follow the two wires. So one of the things that, that I'm teaching in my book, section three, is to follow the wire that doesn't go to the computer will always tell you what's in the computer. And if you look at the diagram, you see the white wire goes to the computer and we call that our control wire. This is our control wire. Any output that would go to the computer, we call that our control wire. Um, and notice inside the computer, that's this piece right here, this is the PCM, um, there is no internal guts, it doesn't show you a transistor or um, anything inside, so we, we don't know circuit design by looking at that control wire. Okay? So we follow the wire that doesn't go to the computer, and that's this pink wire, and it's easy in my diagram because I pieced it together, but you can see that it goes to a fuse. So this pink wire is 12 volt feed. And if the pink wire is 12 volt feed, that means our control wire is ground side switched. A solenoid needs a power and a ground to work. For this thing to make a magnetic field, we need a power, we need a ground, and this is a ground side switch circuit. So what we know now, inside of this computer would be a transistor that is going to switch to ground when the computer commands it to. So this is a ground side switch circuit. Some other info that's helpful in this design, is this is a normally open solenoid. GM vent solenoids for their EVAP systems, they're all normally open. Um, that's further research, I'm not gonna show that part. Normally open vent solenoid ground side switch, that's what we're dealing with. Another piece of info that you could read if you pull the flow chart up for this 449 code, which I did already, and I just wanna show you that this reinforces what we just found on the wiring diagram, and that is our 449 code, the description on this, it says ignition voltage is supplied directly to the EVAP emission vent valve, which we found, right? 
The control module controls the EVAP vent valve by grounding the control circuit via an internal switch called a driver. Sound familiar? So this is a ground side switch circuit. So it wasn't only the wiring diagram that showed us that. Um, it was also in the description of the, of the flow chart. So I know I'm anti flow charts, but um, not 100%. I still use them as a guide and, and I don't want you guys to totally disregard an engineer flow chart. They, they've definitely gotten a lot better. Uh, the older ones were horrible, the newer ones are a lot better. Um, and then another statement in here that I think is important to pick out is that um, the control module monitors the status of the driver. So what that means is the computer is basically watching voltage levels on this circuit for a fault. So it's not just controlling the circuit, it's also watching the circuit. So to give you a real quick idea of what that might look like, I'm just going to draw a generic picture of a solenoid and a transistor controlling the ground side of it, this being internal to the computer. This is our feed and this would be our control wire. Inside of this computer there is a voltage sensing circuit that's going to monitor, and we can just think of this as a voltmeter, the computer is going to monitor the voltage level right here on this control circuit. And it knows when the driver is on or off, obviously it's the computer, it's controlling that driver. And what it wants to see with this driver off is it wants to see 12 volts. And I know what you might be thinking, that 12 volts on the ground of this circuit, that doesn't make sense. Why are we not getting a voltage drop across this coil? The coil represents resistance in the circuit, but again, with no current flow, there will be no voltage drop. So what should be occurring with this driver off, so no continuity to ground, there should be 12 volts on the, on the feed wire, and there should be 12 volts on the control wire because power for this circuit it's going to come through, it's going to wrap through the winding, and it's going to come to the driver and look for a ground. There is no ground yet, so there is no voltage drop, and the computer wants to see right here 12 volts. So that's what this is talking about when it says the, the module monitors the status of the driver. That's where this trouble code's coming from. And when I said earlier that when you have a trouble code for circuit design, sorry, when you have a trouble code for a circuit problem, it's never going to be a leak code. We're dealing with an electrical fault here. When you see solenoid circuit error, solenoid circuit high, solenoid circuit low, we're never worried about the mechanical aspect of, of the component. We're worried about the electrical part of it. So 12 volts is off, and when the driver is commanding on, on is going to be zero volts or at least near zero volts and what will happen when the driver turns on is this leg of the circuit this leg of the circuit is going to switch to ground provides a ground for the solenoid so this side will stay at 12 but this side will drop to zero or at least near zero we're allowing a few hundred millivolts on the ground it will drop to zero with the circuit on so this would be the logic behind it off is 12 computer wants to see on is zero what happens when the computer um, sees with the circuit off if it sees zero volts what's going to happen you're going to get a trouble code for this vent solenoid. What happens if the computer is commanding on and we have 12 volts on that control wire, you are going to get a trouble code for this solenoid. Now our code description said EVAP system vent control circuit low was the definition on the scan tool of the 449 code. Circuit low with that code, we can pretty much assume right now that the computer's reading zero volts all the time on that circuit. We're going to verify that right now, but that's what that code means to me, is the computer's not seeing voltage on that circuit when it wants to. When would the computer want to see 12 volts on that circuit? It would want to see 12 volts with the circuit off. So now we're going to go to the truck. 
we're going to take two voltage measurements, and that's going to be on these two wires at the solenoid. Our pink wire, and this is hot in run or start, the fuse for this circuit. So we turn the key on. We want to see 12 volts on this pink wire. We're going to put a T-pin in that pink wire. We're going to put a voltmeter connected to ground and get a reading on it like that. Okay? Then the next step we're going to do, we're going to move the T-pin over, and we're going to get a voltmeter reading on the control wire to a known good ground. Now, a warning on these T-pins. I know I use them a lot. You guys have been seeing me use T-pins in a lot of my videos. T-pins are dangerous. Uh, T-pins can fry computers. Um, in this scenario right here, if you used two T-pins, because we're going to do two measurements, so maybe you think you want to save some time and you're going to double T-pin this solenoid connector because we're going to take two readings. We need to do both wires. So you've decided that you're going to put a T-pin in this one and you're going to put a T-pin in this one. If these two T-pins touch each other, you have the potential of cooking the computer driver over here. Now it won't fry it unless the driver's on, but let's say you T-pin that circuit when that driver was turned on. If this driver's on, that means this switch is closed to ground. That's what a driver is, is a switch. And these two T-pins touch each other. What's going to happen? You're going to have 12 volts. It's going to come down this wire, cross the T-pins, and go on its way to the computer straight to ground. And what you've done is you've bypassed the resistance of the coil. You just cooked that computer by double T-pinning that solenoid. Never double T-pin a solenoid, ever. So that's number one. The second thing that can be dangerous about a T-pin would be if you have this T-pin here, you're taking a measurement on the control wire, and this T-pin happens to touch ground on the frame of the car or the block or something metal. Now in this case, no damage to the computer at all, even if the driver's on, because what happens if that T-pin touches is that power is going to come down, go through the coil, sorry, that's the resistor, it'll go through the, power is going to come down, go through the coil, and have a path to ground through the T-pin. The only thing that would happen in that case is the solenoid is just going to energize. We're not going to hurt the driver, no big deal, on a ground side switch circuit. However, if this is a power side switch driver, let's say that, let's say that this side of the solenoid went to a ground externally, that means that my white control wire would now be a power side switch design, and the driver in the computer would be what's supplying power in this case, and you're T-pinning this control wire for voltage, we're trying to do a voltage measurement, and that driver happened to be on, here's what happens. Power is going to come through the transistor, out this way, into the T-pin and straight to ground, and you've just cooked that driver with one T-pin. So when we use T-pins, what do we not want to do? Don't use two of them, and don't let them touch ground. On a ground side switch solenoid, which thankfully most of our solenoids are, we're pretty safe. We are safe if we just use one. Okay? Be careful with the T-pins, please. All right, we're going to go to the truck. We're going to take two measurements. And when we do these two measurements, again, we are going to use one T-pin. We're going to get a measurement here, and we're going to get a measurement here. Let's go to the truck. Alright, so I'm, I'm under the truck, above the frame, and our vent solenoid connector is right there. And you see my yellow voltmeter leads connected to a T-pin that is back probing this connector. I'm leaving it plugged in. And uh, that wire does look orange, but weather has a, a way of changing colors. That's supposed to be a pink wire. But that's my power feed wire, and we're going to see what we have, turn the key on, see what voltage we have on that wire. 
All right, I'm using the snap on Barris and I'm just using it, using it in voltmeter mode to uh, have big numbers on the screen. Um, and you can see that we have 12.42 volts on our power feed to our solenoid. So that means our fuse is good and our feed wire all the way from the fuse box to the solenoid is good. The next step is gonna to be to move the T-pin to the control wire and get a reading on it. Okay, we moved the T-pin over to the white wire, which is our control wire. And my yellow probe, my voltmeter lead, is now connected to the T-pin. We'll get a reading on the control wire now. All right, so we're looking at control wire voltage now. And you see we have zero volts on this circuit. Now one of the things that I want to talk about is a variable when you see zero volts. When we expected to see 12, but we're seeing zero, is you might not be connected to the circuit. So I want to show a couple ways to, to do that, and I've showed it before. It really involves shaking your multimeter leads or connecting and disconnecting. Um, can you go ahead and unplug that uh, connector from that T-pin, and we'll watch the voltage reading. And you see it changed. So we went to 200 millivolts and plug it back into it. So we're definitely getting a change in voltage. That's telling me I'm connected to that circuit. I'm gonna show you this on a graphing multimeter, which is gonna be a little bit more evident on what we're looking at. <clears throat> this is a, um, a 20 volt scale right now, which isn't gonna be ideal for this. Go ahead and, uh, I'll tell you in a second. Go ahead and take the clip off. You see this little blip in the screen right here. Not really much to go by. I got to connect it back up. And you see it again that we're now connected to this wire. But what I want to do in, in this case, let's drop our scale. We'll go to a one volt scale and take a look at it. <clears throat> and you can see our, our zero line right now. Go ahead and take the clip off. Big difference. We're not in the circuit right now. We're just picking up interference from our lighting in the room and everything else. Um, the other thing that you can do, you know, this is evident enough, but the other thing you can do is you can take your, your test lead, I'll show you this part, and if you shake your lead, we can make some voltage spikes in the circuit by shaking our lead, and go ahead and connect it up. You do the same check with a connected, you shake the lead, you notice a nice steady line we are definitely in that circuit, and now I can, I can definitely rely on this being a zero volt signal on our control wire. It should be 12 right now. It is zero. The computer is not turning this solenoid on right now. Uh, this solenoid only gets turned on for EVAP leak testing. So right now, with just the key on engine off, that driver should be off. This should be 12 volts right now, and it is zero. All right, we're going back to the board for a minute. All right, so we took two measurements. In our two measurements that we had, we had 12 volts on this wire, and we have zero volts on our control wire. This is a ground side switch circuit, and of course it helps to know whether or not this driver is on or off. And this driver is off right now, and we should have 12 volts on this control wire. So what we have is what I would call a ground side switch circuit that is fixed low. This is in my book, section three. This is actually page 16. So this would be low volts on the control wire with the driver commanded off. Ground side switch circuit with the driver commanded off should be 12 volts. What are we reading? We're reading zero volts. So I'm giving you a couple testing methods we can use. I'm gonna show these. And the one that we're going to do is we're gonna use a test light now. And we're gonna put a test light connected to battery positive on the control wire. And the result of this test light is gonna lead us either to the right or to the left. We're at a fork in the road, we're gonna turn left or we're gonna turn right, depending on the result of the test light. So, one of the things that we can do first, before I show you this, is just kind of get a picture up here and get an idea of what we're dealing with on a ground side switch circuit. I'll simplify it, I'll just draw it as a, as a switch. That's what the transistor is. We are at 12 volts on this side. We are at zero volts on this side. There are basically four variables that we want to think about with this particular problem. 
One of them would be, and this one's pretty easy to visualize, an open in the coil of the solenoid itself would cause this condition. So that's one. I would put that as, as an open coil. An open coil would definitely be one of the conditions. Another one would be that the control wire is sorted to ground. If the control wire is sorted to ground, that circuit is going to have a ground all the time and that's going to read 12 and 0 all the time. So another variable would be a sort to ground on the control wire. And then another one would be that the driver itself is faulty and it, it's melted internally and it's sorted driver, sorted to ground driver, would do the same thing, that it would keep the solenoid on all the time. It would have a ground all the time, it would be 12 and 0. So a sorted driver would be on here. And one more would be this connector itself. And generally when you have a connector problem, somebody's been there before you and they grabbed a test light, grabbed a multimeter, and they stuffed the lead into the female part of the connector and spread the pin apart. So as far as the connector goes, it's just going to be a visual inspection on the connector itself because we're measuring it right at the component. But you can't forget about the connector, especially, especially if someone was there before you, which a lot of the cars we get, somebody's been there before us, and we got to undo what they did, right? All right, so what I want to do here in this scenario is I want to shorten my testing time. And what I found is, in this case, the test light is ideal for this application. And what I'm going to do, we're going to take a test light, connect it to battery positive in this case, and we're going to look at the state of the light. And in my book, what I'm telling you to do is to unplug the solenoid for this step because we don't want to get any kind of back feed. If we left this solenoid plugged in, we would not want to get some kind of back feed through the solenoid and maybe there's another circuit that shares this power feed that could give us misleading results. Uh, an example of that would be you had a fuel pump that's also running off of this circuit. You had a fuel pump motor or whatever, and that's not the case here. But if you put your test light to battery positive, would that test light, would that test light find a ground through the coil and then through the fuel pump motor and the light would light? And that would lead you to think that you had a short. That's what we're doing here is we're addressing those two right now with this test light. So... I'm telling you in my book to disconnect the solenoid, and that would be, on, on this step you can see the procedure I'm walking you through, sorry, it's this one. And you see in this picture that I'm having the solenoids disconnected here. That's important when you're doing this, this test light test. The solenoid's disconnected here, solenoid is disconnected here, and I'm showing you the result of the test light. I just want to leave that variable out of this. Let's go back to my drawing. So solenoid disconnected, get it out of the picture so we don't get a back feed. Make sure we don't have a back feed. If that test light lights in this procedure, if that test light is lit, it is not an open in the coil that was causing your zero volt problem. It is not a connector problem that was causing our zero volt all the time problem. It is either a short to ground on the control wire or a shorted driver. So how do we address that? Let's say it was that. First thing is, if it was these two, we'd have current flow all the time, wouldn't we? And these two, there would be no current flow. That's why I have the amp probe up here too, as far as another method of identifying this problem. I'm not showing the amp probe one right now. Just do the test light. So there would be current flow all the time with a short to ground on the control shorted driver. Our test light would be lit. How would you determine which of the two it is? Very simple from this point, disconnect the computer. If that test light stays lit with the computer unplugged, that driver's fine, you have a short to ground in the control wire. If you disconnect that computer and that light goes out, 
you have a sorted driver, your control wire is fine. And so I've done that in here. And um, if you look at uh, this procedure, let's get rid of this. <clears throat> oh, it's up here. Connect the test lights, battery positive, touch on the control wire, unplug, solenoid unplugged, we don't want a back feeding problem. Test light on, we have a sorted control wire, a sorted driver, and then I'm walking you through these figures, figure 7B, 7C, D, that's these ones here. So as you're following this in my book, what you can do is you can follow the figures as I'm going. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the solenoid and we're going to use our test light, connect it to battery positive, and see the result of that. All right, so we're going to do the test light method now. And I have a test light right now connected to battery positive. And uh, I don't know, is that in the screen? Can you see my test light? See my test light? Not really, huh? There you go. All right, I got my test light connected to battery positive. Um, when I, I already checked it, I can't show you here, I'm not going to stab the paint of this truck to show you the light lights. Um, when I touch a ground, this light is going to light. Rather than going <clears throat> underneath the vehicle and touching the T-pin with the test light, I already have a meter connected to it. All I'm going to do is unplug this from my, from my multimeter, my Varus. This yellow lead is connected to that control wire right now. And I'm going to just touch my test light to that internal lead. Um, and that test light, as you can see, is off in this step. So what we know right now is this is not a shorted control wire. It is not a shorted driver. We either have an open solenoid or we got a bad connector at this point. All right, so we did our test light procedure. It's this one here. And we have Connect test light to battery positive, touch on the control wire, solenoid unplugged. Now, one thing I didn't do with this one, I did not unplug the solenoid. Um, the only reason I didn't feel the need to on this one, I checked the diagram, and there's no possible way for a back feed on this circuit. Just for ease of diagnosis, I just pulled the lead out of my multimeter, took a reading. Our test light was not lit, so test light is off. Here's our options, open solenoid or open solenoid connector. What do we do? Go to figure 7E, and this is in my book. 7E is this one, and this is where we're at. Test light was off. I crossed out the two sorted circuits, open solenoid connector. And what I'm showing, the next thing you could do to verify, and it really does, we don't need to do this, we're pretty much done. This solenoid is open internally, okay? Um, but I'm showing a solenoid disconnected and a simple ohm test. If you see where that solenoid lives, Putting an ohm meter on that is going to be next to impossible without unbolting the whole assembly and pulling it out. So I don't want to do that. And so I want to do one more thing that's going to make me feel 100% about this call. And that's going to be the control... Sorry. To be 100% with this, we didn't check the control circuit. For opens, we didn't check the driver. Now granted we didn't really need to for this diagnosis, we have an open solenoid, but to be 100% and make sure everything else is working like it should, this would be um, page 12, section 3, is we're going to check the computer driver and we're going to check the control wire from the solenoid all the way to the computer, we're going to make sure there's no opens in that circuit. Because you can have an open solenoid and an open control wire. We've already addressed the sorted control wire. It can't be a sorted control wire. But you could have an open in the control wire too. And you make a call, put a solenoid in this vehicle, and it comes back with the same code. And the customer's mad. You missed it. There were two faults. It does happen. So we want to address it. And what we're going to do is we're dealing with a ground side switch circuit. We're going to take this circuit, connect our test light to 12 volts, and we're going to command the driver on with the scan tool. And if that test light lights, what that's going to tell you is this control wire and driver are also good. And it's just going to back up what we're calling here, which is a bad solenoid. It's going to make us feel a lot better about the process.
Okay? If that test light does not turn on, then you have a control wire issue or driver issue and uh, as well as what we have an open solenoid. So last test on this, test light to battery positive, touch on the control wire, command it on with the scan tool. I'm just going to show you the test light first. I have it hanging there. It's attached to my lead still. Go to my scan tool. I'll show you where I'm at in the scanner in a second. My key is on and I'm in bi-directional mode and you can see I can turn my test light on and off. So what's that tell us about our control wire and our driver on this truck? Not a problem at all. Put a solenoid in this vehicle. That's what it needs. And of course, once you unbolt it, if you'd like to, you could do an ohm check to make you feel 110% sure, but not really necessary here. This is a good working control circuit and driver. We have definitely an open in our coil on our solenoid. Common problem on any solenoid, really, this kind of scenario, what we're, what we're dealing with. All right, I'll show you a real quick picture on the scan tool of what I'm doing. All right, just real quick show you what we're doing. We're going to functional tests. We're going to output controls. This is going to be unique to the vehicle you're working on. Go to the vent solenoid. <coughs> I got my test light still connected. Up top, up here, no reason to look at any of my data pids. Up top, and it says device control limit exceeded. Well, I didn't anticipate that, but I guess we got to talk about that now. There are timers for these output controls to get past this, this control limit exceeded. You hit exit, get out of that mode completely, turn the key off. I can't reach it. Can you reach that key? Turn the key off, wait five seconds because you want the computer to power down. Turn the key back on. And then we'll redo the test, it should work this time. So that's those generic timers they use. That's good right there, it's in the screen. Go back to our output controls. I might not have gone back far enough. This might mess me up, but vent solenoid. Turn it on. And there's my test light lighting. Turn it off. Test light's off. That is how you do it with a scan tool. That is a scan tool bi-directional control. All right, that's it. That is a 19, no. That, that is a 2002 Chevy Silverado vent solenoid circuit malfunction. This would be the same thing that you would do on any GM EVAP system with a vent solenoid code for 20 years, be the same testing procedures.